Jack didn't like parking garages. There was something eerie about the flickering fluorescent lighting and the way sounds echoed. The elevators always seemed to be on the verge of breaking and were infested by foul and mysterious odours. Jack breathed a sigh of relief when the elevator doors opened. He hustled toward the garage's exit. At first he heard only the sound of his own shuffling footsteps, but then he was sure he heard another pair of footsteps behind him. He casually glanced over his shoulder. There was no need to be afraid. It was probably just some regular person on a regular errand like he was. But Jack saw no one. He chalked it up to the weird echo effect of the parking garage and walked through the exit onto the street. He, put, he walked past the dry cleaners and an insurance office. Most of the businesses on the street were dark and locked up for the night, but in the distance he could see the light of the Donkey Doman sign with its smiling donut mascot. He heard the footsteps behind him again. He turned around but only saw a flash of movement as whoever it was ducked into an alley. Jack was pretty sure he was just being paranoid after his near-death experience earlier in that day. It made sense that his nerves were on edge. He heard the steps again. They sounded wet, squishy, like somebody walking in galoshes uh, in the rain. Jack started walking more quite, uh, quickly sorry, and the steps sped up to match his. He was tempted to turn around and confront the person, but what good would that do if the person were armed? He broke into a run, though he knew he was too out of shape to run for long. The squishy steps behind him ran too. Suddenly the donut shop seemed too far away to be a safe destination. He had to go inside somewhere to find a place with people and lights, a place where his pursuer would not follow him. He caught sight of an office building on the left, tried the door and found it open. Once inside, he noticed that the door had a chain, which he quickly fastened. There was also a lock on the doorknob, which he turned. Feeling a little safer, he took a deep breath and turned around to survey the place where he found himself. There were no people, and the only light was from a single bare bulb overhead. The building looked abandoned. Graffiti had been spray-painted all over the walls. The glass in the windows had been smashed, and doors that had once led to offices had been torn off their hinges. He glanced inside one room to see a desk and a broken office chair and piles of garbage, probably from people who had been squatting in the space. Squatters. There was something else to fear. But the building was as silent as a mausoleum, or mausoleum, and he seriously doubted that the potential mugger who had been following him would go to the trouble of trying to unlock the building's front door. For the time being, he was safe. He glanced back at the front door just to confirm that he'd locked it and saw there was movement in the tiny crack between the bottom of the door and the floor. Something was oozing through the crack. It was some sort of gelatinous substance and its movement was slow and steady. It was pink, but it was a horrible pink. Not the pink of cake frosting and party balloons. It was the pink of some living creature's insides. Okay, I think I know what this is. I think I know what this is, but just in case um, you guys don't know what this is, I'm just going to keep reading and hope that uh, it, it's, it gets explained. Um, Jack took a step backwards. He knew he needed to move more quickly, but he was transfixed by the sight of whatever was in front of him, although it had the appearance of some sort of goo. <laughs> There's your clue. <laughs> There's your clue. It's, it's, it's Fazgoo. It's Fazgoo. It has to be Fazgoo, right? Um, it seemed to be moving under its own power. It wasn't an inanimate substance. It was alive. Yeah, I, I think we assumed this. Okay, okay. <laughs> Fazgoo boys, Fazgoo, it's back. <laughs> Inky Ink is uh, on the floor dying right now. <laughs> the sudden realisation shook Jack out of his trance and he ran down the hallway. He heard the squishy, sloppy steps behind him again, but he didn't turn around to look. He just kept running. At the end of the hall was a door marked exit. He pushed on the door, but it wouldn't budge. Was it locked from the outside? Broken? He turned around. The thing, whatever it was, was getting closer. It was just a pile of parts he couldn't make sense of. Much of it was somewhere between solid and liquid, but there were fully solid parts of it as well. Bundles of long, snake-like tubes, veiny bags and pouches. When Jack was a little boy, he had spent winter break at his grandparents' farm. 
He remembered watching his grandpa and uncle butcher a hog once. They had hung its body from a tree. His uncle had sliced down the hog's middle, and its guts had spilled out into a bucket with a sickening splat. This thing... That was how it sounded when it moved. Oh god. Oh god, why do I know that sound? Since he had no luck with the exit, Jack tried another nearby door. It was unlocked. He quickly opened it, darted in, and slammed and locked the door behind him. He was inside another ruined office. The floor was strewn with garbage and the window was cracked. But strangely, a plaque still hung on the wall saying Employee of the Month. Wait. Oh, sorry, yeah, a plaque still hung on the wall saying Employee of the Month. An empty bookshelf about the height of Jack's waist had been knocked onto the floor. Jack dragged it to the door and shoved it under the doorknob at an angle. Winded, uh, Jack sat down in the chair behind the desk. Here he was, looking like the boss he had been for years, but in a ruined office, hiding in fear for his life. He should have known the locked door was useless. Long, slimy tendrils were already snaking their way through the cracks underneath it. Pink slime dripped around the sides of the door and pulled onto the floor, merging itself with the creeping tendrils. Just like the tendrils that we see in... Uh, he told me everything. Uh, Jack looked to the window as a possible escape route, but more of the globby substance was slithering over the windowsill. Jack looked back at the door, where the thing continued to ooze out. Is there more than one thing, or is it all the same thing? What's, what, what is happening? <laughs> My question exactly, what is happening? Uh, there was a loud slurp, a loud, loud slurping sound like someone trying to pull their feet out of deep mud. Rapidly, so fast that you couldn't even make sense of it. The mass of slime and solids reconstituted, re, reconstituted. Um, <laughs> itself into an upright being that sat in the chair across the desk from Jack. The thing had approximations of arms and legs and a lumpy mound that stood in for a head. It was made of the translucent pink goo under which its organs were visible. Oh god. Somehow it reminded Jack of the awful gelatin salad his mum used to make with canned fruit suspended under the slimy surface. It had no mouth or nose but it had eyes dark eyes that stared at Jack as though the thing could see into him the way he could see into it. What? What do you want? Jack asked, his voice trembling. He didn't want to die, not when he had just had one near miss, not when he was just remembering what was important. The creature kept looking at him, then slowly it raised one arm and reached toward him. Like elastic, its arm stretched, growing thinner as it reached across the length of the desk to touch Jack's face. <laughs> Elastigals here. <laughs> pain like Jack had never known shot through him. But it wasn't physical pain. He felt the pain of hurt, neglect, abuse. It was the pain of every employee he had ever yelled at or fired. The pain of his son every time he had missed one of his ball games or unfairly criticised him. The pain of his wife for every forgotten birthday or unkind word. Oh, oh, oh. oh my god. Jack was filled with all the emotional pain he had ever caused, and it was more intense than he could bear. He doubled over and squeezed his tear-filled eyes shut, sure he was about to die from a real broken heart. But then the pain left him, just as suddenly as it had come, and he was awash in an overwhelming sense of relief. When he opened his eyes, the creature was gone. Becky was in bed but awake, watching one of her shows about home remodelling on TV. Hiya, Bex, Jack said, pleased to hear his old pet name for her come out of his mouth. He sat down on the bed next to her. Can I talk to you for a few minutes? Sure. She aimed the remote and switched off the TV. Is everything okay? You're not sick or anything, are you? Her brow furrowed like it did when she was worried. No, nothing like that. Good, I mean, it's, it's been a very long time since you've seen like you wanted to talk to me, so I was afraid it was going to be something bad. It is bad, but you've done nothing wrong. Uh, I wanted to say, I know I've been a bad... No, it's nothing like that. Good, I mean... Wait. Wait, <laughs> wait. <laughs> I was very confused there. Okay, it's it's a it's a duplicate. Sorry. Um, I, I was... So I was afraid it was going to be something bad. 
It is bad, but you've done nothing wrong. I wanted to say, I know I've been a bad husband lately, and I'm sorry. Lately didn't begin to cover it, he knew. He couldn't remember the last time he'd acted like a decent husband. Maybe when Tyson was little? Wow. There were tears in her eyes, which she wiped away. I wasn't expecting that. But from now on, you can expect better of me. You can demand better of me. He felt his eyes getting a little teary too. Part of the reason I've been on so on edge is money. The business isn't doing well, Bex. The animatronics keep breaking. Families aren't showing up. I'm losing all this money on food. I, I don't know how much longer the pizza playground can limp along. Becky took his hand and held it. It had been a long time since she had done that. Oh, honey, you should have told me. And here I've been yammering away about remodeling and all this stuff that costs a lot of money. I never would have even suggested it if I'd known you'd been worried about money. From now on, you've got to promise me that you will tell me when something's wrong. Jack nodded. I will. I promise. And I promise I'll do the same. She looked him in the eyes. Actually, you know, I think the reason I've obsessed over the house so much is that I've been sad ever since Tyson left home. Fixing up things in the house distracted me from how much I miss him. Oh, I miss him too, Jack said. Nobody tells you how hard it's going to be when your kid goes off to college. Becky wiped away another tear. They act like it's going to be one big party, but it's not. Actually, I've been thinking I might go back to work. There's an opening at my old real estate office and they called to ask if I was interested. I figured that way I could keep my mind active and see other people during the day. She squeezed his hand. Plus, if I got a job, we'd have two incomes instead of one. It might ease some of your financial worries. Jack tucked a lot of hair behind her ear. If that's really what you want to do, then I support you. Back before Tyson was born, Becky had been a successful real estate agent. He had to admit that the thought of someone else in the family earning money was comforting. It's really what I want to do, she smiled. There's no need to be a stay-at-home mum when there's no kids staying at home anymore. It was either get a job or get a dog to turn into my surrogate child. I think you made the right choice, Jack said, smiling in return. Say, do you think Tyson's still up? It's not even 11, and he's a college student. Becky said. Of course he's still up. For him, the night is young. C'est la vie. <laughs> uh, she snuggled down under the covers. But it's past my bedtime. Mine too, Jack agreed. But all the same, I want to give Tyson a call. Jack took his phone into the kitchen and poured himself a glass of water. Tyson answered on the first ring, but he sounded low. Hey buddy, Jack said. I just wanted to check in to see how you're doing. I promise I haven't spent any of your money, if that's what you want to know. No, I wasn't calling about money, I was calling about you. Really? Tyson's tone had a hard edge. Because when you when we talked earlier this week, you wouldn't even let me tell you about the car emergency I had. You were too upset that I had charged your credit card $900 to make the repairs. Jack felt a little tug at his heart. Was what Tyson's saying true? Could Jack really have been so cold? I'm sorry if that's how I seemed. You didn't have an accident, did you? No, but I, I could have easily. My car broke a belt on the interstate and just stopped dead. It was a miracle I didn't get hit. All these cars were whizzing past me and I was right in the center lane. Finally, a police officer helped me get the car moved on to the side of the road and called a tow truck. Oh God, <laughs> that wasn't a very good accent. Called a tow truck. I was really scared, Dad. His voice broke with emotion. Anybody would have been scared in that situation, son. Jack felt the full weight of guilt bearing down on him. I'm I'm just glad you're okay. Did the mechanic get the car fixed okay? Yeah, it's running great now. Good. Jack knew that the mechanic had overcharged Tyson, taking advantage of the fact that Tyson was an in inexperienced boy who didn't know what a fair price was. But the important thing was that Tyson was safe. You couldn't put a price on that. Listen, buddy, I'm going to let you go, Jack said. I'm sure you've got way more interesting things to do than to talk to your old man. If you need anything, let me know, okay? I love you, buddy. I love you too, Dad, Tyson said, sounding confused. Oh my god, I didn't think this was going to be a, an emotional story. <laughs> I did not think this was going to be emotional at all. Um, okay. Doobie doobie doo. 
Jack climbed the stairs, put on his pyjamas and brushed his teeth. He slid into the cool, clean bedsheets uh, beside Becky, who was already asleep. As soon as Jack closed his eyes, so was he. It was a deep, peaceful rest. Porter didn't have much of an appetite, but he nibbled on, on his toast and sipped his coffee. He couldn't face the two side-up eggs on his plate and wasn't sure why he had ordered them, except out of habit. It felt like the eggs were staring at him judgmentally. He knew that was what was bothering him, was the same thing that was bothering everybody else in their booth in the Golden Haifa, where, uh, where they were having their traditional late sun... Oh my gosh, Saturday morning breakfast. They had all received a call from Jack, all agreed to report back to work at the pizza playground, but they were fearful about what might happen when they got there. Angie was toying with her pancakes. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how bad a mood do you think Jack will be in today? An 11. Definitely an 11, Sage said, picking at his fruit plate. I've got a job interview at that fancy new steakhouse on Monday, Edwin said. They're still hiring, I'm just saying. I don't think I'd ever get hired as a server someplace fancy, Angie said. I'm not ladylike enough, you know? She crammed a whole strip of bra- of bra- ah! <laughs> She crammed a whole strip of bacon in her mouth as if to illustrate her point. I'm doomed to sling pizzas at preschoolers. Yeah, I guess the fancy steakhouse has animatronics they need somebody to service. Porter threw in. Sorry. Yeah, Sage said, laughing. But wouldn't it be weird if they did? There'd be all these rich adults eating steak and lobster and singing head, shoulders, knees and toes, along with Baron Von Baer and his friends. Edwin smiled at Sage and shook his head. You are weird, man. But they're hiring cleaning staff for the, sh for the night shift. You ought to apply. Fancy places need their bathrooms clean just like regular places. That's encouraging to hear, Sage said. You know me, student and novelist by day, toilet scrubber by night. Ooh, sexy. <laughs> uh, they paid their bill and walked together to the pizza playground with all the enthusiasm of condemned prisoners. When they reached the building, they saw the outside had been decorated with dozens of brightly coloured blooms. A sign read, special today, large cheese pizza, four drinks, for ten dollars, includes 25 free game tokens. Porter couldn't imagine Jack ever voluntarily giving away anything for free. That's actually a pretty good deal, he said. Apparently other people thought so too. A family of four paused and looked at the sign. The dad reached into his wallet, pulled out a $10 bill and said, why not? The family went inside. Wow, Porter said. I feel almost hopeful. Sage wasn't as enthused. Be careful, remember that Jack has given us plenty of reasons to be pessimistic. Porter had to admit that Sage was right. They entered the dining area. Jack was standing next to the table with the family who had just come in and was chatting with them as he filled their glasses and set the pitcher with the rest of the soda on the table. Porter was shocked to see Jack pleasantly interacting with and actually waiting on customers. Did you see that? Angie whispered to Porter and Sage. Since when does Jack hand out free refills without customers practically begging for them? Since now, apparently, Porter said. And look at his face. What is he doing? Sage was similarly in shock. I think he's smiling. <laughs> seeing Jack smile was like seeing a dog dancing on his hind legs. It wasn't physically impossible, but it seemed highly unlikely. There's my stellar staff, Jack said, giving them a friendly wave. Edwin, would you be so willing to go into the kitchen and make those fine folks one of your delicious pizzas? Sure. Edwin said, looking at Jack like he had just sprouted an extra head. <laughs> Angie, Sage, Porter, how are you guys doing today? Jack said, grinning at them. It's getting close to final exams, isn't it? Are you studying hard? <laughs> For some reason, it just, he just feels like a completely different person. Like like a presenter or something. Um, you know you know what I mean? Do you know what, you, do you know what I mean? I've... I hope you know what I mean, otherwise I'm going to sound stupid. Uh, that's why I'm putting on a different voice for him. It's, it's quite funny. It's like a Markiplier voice, like, Are you studying hard? Um, Porter looked over at his equally confused friends. Y yes sir, that's good, Jack said. I'm proud of you. Thank you, sir. How much do you want to bet that Jack 
isn't actually Jack, but he is a Fazgu replacement of Jack. I reckon that's probably what is going down in this in this story because it will match like the phys I guess chemistry of um like the the science of what happened in He Told Me Everything. It's this the same sort of concept. But maybe that's not how it's gonna go. Maybe maybe I'm not predicting very well. Angie, Sage, Porter, how are you guys doing today? Jack said, grinning at the I just realized I'm reading the same line. <laughs> I hate that. Um, Jack grinned warmly at the trio, taking them aside. I do hope that all of you will accept my apologies for my behaviour yesterday. Uh, that is a spelling mistake. Um, I also hope that you'll accept a $2 an hour raise. He gave Porter a chuck on the shoulder. And what's with all this sir stuff? There's no need for formality. This is pizza playground. We're here to have fun. Porter and Sage shared a look. In the past, Jack had always demanded that his employees call him Sir, as if he were their drill sergeant in boot camp. Another family of four came in, perhaps also lured by the $10 special. Welcome, welcome, Jack called, like an enthusiastic game show host. Oh my god, I basically said that. <laughs> Who's ready for pizza, games, and a show? All the kids cheered while their parents smiled down at them. Angie seated the new family and took their drink orders. Porter went behind the stage to make sure that the animatronics and sound system were in good working order. On the other side of the curtain, he could hear children talking and laughing, the games in the arcade beeping and blipping. He wasn't sure what had caused the change, but whatever it was, Pizza Playground had started to feel like it, what it was supposed to. A place for families to have fun. A place where the employees helped create an atmosphere of entertainment and even enjoyed themselves in the process. But how could the place have felt so bad yesterday and feel the opposite today? How could Jack have fired the whole staff yesterday, then rehired them and showered them with kind words in a raise today? It didn't make any sense. Porter remembered something his mum used to say. When good luck happens, don't question it. It was sound advice. He programmed the show to start. He stepped backstage so he wouldn't be seen by the audience. The canned music started to play and the sparkly red curtain parted to reveal the two patched together, barely moving animatronic figures, the bear and the weird bird thing, that now made up the house band. Even with just two performers on the stage, the kids in the audience screamed like rabid fans at a music festival. Porter chuckled. It was nice that they were enjoying the fruits of his labour. Later tonight, he thought, I should tinker around some more with the puppet carver and see if I can figure out what went wrong. Maybe if I can get it fixed and if Jack's still in a good mood, he'd be willing to watch another demonstration. A successful one this time. Oh no! Oh no, he's gonna do... Oh no. Something's gonna happen. I don't know what's gonna happen, but something's gonna happen because of that. Like, I, I was just thinking just now, like... Oh, a happy ending to a story, but I don't think this is going to be a happy ending. The $10 special had been a success. Families had trickled in over the course of the night to take advantage of the cheap dinner offer, and business, though not blooming, blooming, booming, had been steady. Jack felt encouraged. No, he, he felt more than encouraged. He felt great. Tonight, he looked around, at, uh, around the restaurant. He saw not a doomed money pit, but a place full of possibilities. He just had to think harder about ways to bring people in and tonight had been evidence that when he put his brain to use and tried something new, his efforts would be rewarded. Making the place a success was a challenge, but it was a challenge he could rise to. One question he could write question? One reason he could rise to the challenge was because of his great employees. But in order to ensure their loyalty, he had to let them know that he appreciated them. Porter and Angie were wiping down the tables in the dining area and Sage was mopping the floor. They were all such hard workers. He knew Edwin was working equally hard cleaning up the kitchen. Once the money was rolling in better, Jack thought he should hire a dishwasher to help Edwin out in the kitchen. When business was booming and Jack uh, felt sure that it would soon, one guy in the kitchen wouldn't be enough. Hey, are you guys doing anything special after you get out of here? Jack asked. Angie looked at Porter and Sage who shrugged. Just studying, probably. Well, if you guys can stick around for a little bit after closing, I thought I might offer some Chinese takeout. My treat. 
No need to study on such an empty stomach, right? Angie smiled warily. Sure, Jack. Thanks. It was strange. When Jack was kind to them, they seemed suspicious, like they didn't trust him. Like there had to be a catch. Well, he was just going to have to work harder to earn their trust. That's the truth, Porter said. No offence to your pizza cooking skills, Edwin. Edwin smiled, none taken. I probably get stick I probably get sicker of it than the rest of you, since I'm cooking and eating it. You've been really nice all day today, Sage said. He looked at Jack with a strange intensity. It's like you're a new man. Jack smiled, happy to be at a table full of happy people sharing good food. It felt like a holiday, a celebration. It was the way things should be. He wasn't sure why things felt so different, so much better. But they did. Jack really was a new man. Extract from the puppet carver. Sylvester held his newborn daughter in his arms. Oh my god. With one hand, he touched her impossibly soft cheek. His eyes filled with tears at the same time his lips spread into a smile. This, he thought, this was what it meant to be human. The end. So I'm assuming that's a whole metaphor for Jack. I, I don't know. Sage couldn't believe it. The novel was finished. As he walked backstage to the storage room, he read and reread the novel's last line, smiling to himself. Sage would never admit it to anyone, but he was so moved by the beauty of this novel that there were tears in his eyes. It had taken him so many long nights of writing and rewriting, of sacrificing sleep and time with friends. Finally, he was completely satisfied with his work and hoped that soon a publisher would be too. And then it would be goodbye, pizza playground, and hello, bestseller list. He laughed out loud. He knew he was being ridiculously optimistic, but why not? It could happen. He just needed to do a favour for a friend, and then he could go home to celebrate. Sage pulled back the glittery purple curtain. There it was, the puppet carver, named in honour of his novel. Porter had told Sage he was going to have to go back to the drawing board and develop what would hopefully be a more effective puppet carver 2.0. The old machine would have to be scrapped, but Porter said if he hadn't, if he didn't have the heart to do it himself. Oh, yeah, Porter said he didn't have the heart to do it himself. Sage had promised that he would take care of it. Sage wrestled with the machine, trying to figure out the best way to get it outside to the dumpster. As he tugged on it, he became aware of a slight sloshing sound. That's where the fazgoo came from, okay. And then there was the smell, a rotting fetid smell that made him gag. It seemed to be coming from the bottom of the machine. <gasps> oh no. Is it is it the body of, of Jack? Is it Jack's body? Please be Jack's body. That would be amazing. Uh, a rotting fetid smell that made him gag. It seemed to be coming from the bottom of the machine. Maybe a rat had crawled in there and died or something. Sage kneeled in front of the puppet carver so he could reach the drawer at the bottom that served as a reservoir for all the waste generated during the carving process. Here we go, he muttered as he prepared for the source of the smell. When he pulled out the drawer, the smell was so strong that his nose was assaulted. The sight was even worse than the smell. Slimy pink entrails and mangled organs. Was that a kidney or a piece of a liver? Not the organs of a rat, but of a much larger creature, human-sized. Sage had no idea what could have happened here, but it was all the more reason to get the whole thing to the dumpster as fast as possible. Holding his breath, he dumped the contents of the drawer in a, in a garbage bag. They landed with a wet splat. He knew, yes, oh my gosh, he knew what? He threw the bag in the dumpster and walked away, ready to put his days at the pizza playground behind him. And I'm assuming that's the end. Ah! No! No, you can't leave us with that. You can't leave us with that. Are you kidding me? Oh, okay. I have a lot of questions, actually, about, about this story. I feel like it's relatively straightforward, but at the same time, it's all just speculation. The first question I have is, what does any of the Sylvester stuff have to do with any of the story? 
I get it was only Sage's story that he was writing. I, I like I get that that was part of the story, as in he was a novelist. But it, it's it's a clear metaphor, right? It's a metaphor for what though? I feel like it was a metaphor for Jack, mainly because he started as a puppet with no feelings. See what I see what I'm talking about? He started with a puppet with no feelings and then became a human being. Much like how Jack at the beginning of the story d just didn't have any feelings for anyone, you know? He he didn't care about anything. Uh, but, at, but at the end, he really cared about everybody and saw that this was what it was like to be a human, to be able to look up at the stars, to be able to look up at the moon and be able to feel something from it, you know? So I, I feel like that's, a, that's the metaphor there. That's just speculation, though. I don't know if you guys have anything better to to correspond that with um, or, or to make parallels with. Um and then the final question, of course, is uh, what's going on with the Fazgu and stuff in this story? I assume that the puppet carver... Huh, I don't know. Because there was no mention of, like, slimy stuff or anything in the puppet carver near the beginning. So, I don't know. I don't know. My first impression is that the puppet carver has Fazgu, and that is what was chasing uh, Jack, obviously, after he had the encounter with the puppet carver. Um, and then there was a replacement at, at that moment. And then during that replacement, the goo Jack became the good Jack. And then the goo Jack uh, threw away the real Jack into the draw of the puppet carver. But I feel like that's a bit of a stretch. I don't know. Guys, if you have any opinions on any of this... Um, any theory, speculation, then please do tell me. I really enjoyed this story. It was a very good way to start. Um, but yeah, tell me you guys what you think. I will see you in the next story, which is Jump for Tickets, which is the one I'm most excited about in this, this book. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you later. Goodbye.